How's my hair look? Hey everybody, welcome back. You know who it is, so I don't even have to go there. But at any rate, this is what we got. Uh, the Beast is back. As opposed to the other B is back in regards to Elton John's 1970s song, but I don't want to go there. Anyway, what we have here is a 2002 Zuki. Uh, this is a Band of 1200S model. And I'm very familiar with this. I don't know if it's on, I don't think it's on any other videos in this um, generation of my channel, that is. Um, I used to own this bike, and I sold it to a young man a number of years ago, and so he has been, um, you know, riding it, and actually, you know, riding it a lot. And so he put a lot of miles on it. It was, it was kind of nicer condition when I sold it. That was three, four years, I don't know, three years ago, something. And I've had it back a few times, uh, obviously uh, back again, but before I've had it back for some small stuff, then I had it back for a big thing when he uh, trashed the transmission. What happened was the clutch slave cylinder apparently went bye-bye, and I think the master was in bad shape too. So he lost a bunch of fluid and he could not get the cover off the top of the master, because it's a hydraulic clutch of course, uh, because uh, the screws were frozen. And so um, he said, all right, I'll just ride it anyway. He ended up trashing second and fifth gear on it. It was actually bouncing in and out of second. It was pretty horrific. So I had the engine out and I split the case. I found a used transmission on eBay, which was actually quite uh, cost effective. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. I just wanted to give you a little background. Uh, complaint right now, he called me yesterday, is that it's um, running poorly, has been for a little while, hard to start in the morning. He said sometimes it's very difficult to crank. In other words, it cranks very slowly. Uh, when it does start, um, when, he's, when he has the, the enricher, or aka choke on, um, it'll um, fall on its face basically even after it warms up a little bit and you take the choke off which this one I remember vividly I mean you could put the ch you could put the enricher on for about 10 seconds and take it off and the thing would run fine so um, I suspect immediately a fuel problem but um, you know well I'll get to what I found here in a minute but so the task at hand here is we need to drill down and figure out what's going on with it I did some quick diagnostics as you can see it's somewhat disassembled right now uh, I did this yesterday because I, I thought it might be a quick turnaround so I didn't turn the camera on at that point but now that it's getting a little bit more in depth I figured I'd go ahead and do that so right now I'm gonna cover what I did so far um, pretty much nothing <laughs> drain the tank got it off uh, the fuel cock is bypassing this is a vacuum actuated fuel cock and it's bypassing a little bit so I'm gonna need to address that uh, I guess it's not to the point where the carbs are overflowing because um, he hasn't mentioned any, anything about that. I don't remember if these carburetors have a um, overflow stack in them. I don't think they do, these McKinney's. Um, so I'm certainly hoping that uh, one of his cylinders didn't uh, get full of gas and he cranked it and now we got a bent connecting rod. I sure as hell hope that's not the case. Uh, when I cranked it without any of the ignition coils in and just the spark plugs in yesterday because I'm trying to diagnose whether or not I have a spark problem and this has stick coil conversion that's a whole nother thing but don't worry about that um, I got spark but the way it cranked I didn't really like the sound of it so I'm gonna crank it real quick with obviously no spark plugs or anything hooked up and, and I'll show you what I mean by that all right double check double triple check we're good there we're good there we're good there all right Contact. All right, the way that's cranking, I do not like. That should not be with that little mm, mm, unless there is a cylinder that's got some liquid in it, but I kind of doubt that. And, you know, if it did, it would certainly not uh, cause a hydrolock issue on cranked. It would simply lock the starter up. It's only when, see what happens with these inline fours. It's only when um, you have its first start up and then it just so happens to be on a fire stroke of a cylinder that's not full of fuel then it starts coming around with that kind of force of combustion and compresses that fuel which it can't do and it bends a conrod so I sure as hell hope that's not the problem on this um, I don't know so what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna I was originally gonna just pull the carbs and start working that way I'm gonna go ahead and lock the throttle open uh, probably take the um, pods off just to help me 
and then I'm going to um, do a compression test on all four cylinders. All right, I'll set up. This ignition switch is fidgety. Always has been, even when I had it. God, it's like the key is slightly cut wrong. But number one cylinder, the other spark plugs are out. The throttle is set it wide open. Let's see what we got. 145, I'll take that. Okay, this will be number two. Let's try to get myself out of the way. That's okay, 145. The battery's, a, I think the battery's a little suspect. Um, he said something about it cranking slow, as I mentioned before, but, um, you know, it's gonna be relative in this particular test. Um, if the battery maintains a certain level of uh, cranking amp ability, we'll just carry that across the four cylinders and just make a comparison. So 145, 145 on one and two is uh, absolutely acceptable. All right, number three. Pretty good. Uh, I'd say maybe 142, well, almost 145. That's pretty good. So that's close. Got my auxiliary fuel can attached and it's uh, hanging from an OSHA approved um, auxiliary fuel can attachment point. And so now we're going to go ahead and energize it. I drained one in four last night, carburetors that is, because I wanted to look at the fuel quality. There was a couple of little bits of particulate, but I don't think anything that would be causing a problem. It is possible, and I think these carbs have a filter at the, um, what do you call it, at the actual float inlet, you know, the float, uh, float jet. Um, if there was some dirty gas, they could be clogged. There is no inline filter on this particular setup because it's in the tank and I, I believe those things there. But at any rate, uh, carbs are certainly charged now as I'm yakking. Let me fiddle with this ridiculous freaking ignition switch. God, what a pain in the ass. Worse than it was when I had it. I'll try lubricating it again or something. Wow, what a pain. All right, I'm going to go with uh, some enrichment. The throttle is definitely not open. I took the throttle lock off. In fact, we'll double check. I don't want this thing to run away. Let's see what we got. Contact. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's see what kind of voltage drop we got when she cranks. Oh yeah. Hmm. It's definitely charging. It was like 13 and a half, but yeah, she don't want to stay running for some reason. I guess we're going to have to snatch the carbs off of it. There's got to be some crud in them carbs based upon what I'm seeing now. Because what I did was I actually put a replacement set of uh, stick coils in that I have in stock. They're a little different part number than the ones that were in there, but they're exact same length, diameter, and uh, exact same ohmage. They're all at 1.5 ohms each. These, these are from a um, Gixxer 750. I forgot what year, like an 02 or 03 or something. I found them on Marketplace and picked them up just in case I needed them because the magnet uses these exact ones so i wanted a set um, as a spare so but i wanted to rule out any stick coil problems so yeah we got a problem with this um ugh, crap off to the races we got to pull the carbs all right stop the presses i forgot to cap off or pinch the uh vacuum line on number four one through three are capped off with these uh with actually extension tubes and little caps on them so it's easier to sink them because you can't reach those caps for nothing in fact, a service manual says to pull the carbs, attach your vacuum um, lines for your tester, put the carbs back on, and then do the opposite when, you, when you're done. So I have extensions on here so we can do that. And those are not the problem, but this was open. I forgot that. So let's try it again. Doi. Yeah, a vacuum leak on, a major vacuum leak on one, on one carburetor would definitely cause a problem. So let's see what we got now.
That's good. I better put some gloves on. Number three. No change. So it's still dropping a cylinder. Yeah, it's definitely number three. I get a change on one, two, and four. So number three, carburetor most likely has got a problem. So we are still down a cylinder because it's definitely sparking. When I pulled the uh, spark plug out of number three, I saw it arcing around trying to find a path to ground. So yeah, definitely we got a problem with number three. So the carbs are absolutely gonna have to come off. So there must be some junk in probably all these carbs, but certainly number three. And so that's a good way to tell, especially with these sticks, they're pretty easy to pull up. Of course, you could do that with spark plug wires too. Uh, but uh, you just pull the sticks up and then, you know, you can see, you saw what happened. Number three, no change. So yep, we're not, we're not getting no fool on number three. And I, I, the way it's idling, it sounds like it's still uh, drop in a cylinder, which obviously it was. So uh, let's go ahead and pull a rack. going to take a look at the carbs now. I'm going to go right for number three. Now when they're upside down like this it can kind of get confusing but I have it set up right now where you have essentially just has to be rotated this way you know forward. So this is still one two three and four because if you rotate it around um, it's still going left to right. So uh, and you have to kind of picture this is the intake side. So we plug the intake side in in our minds uh, then again, one, two, three, four. We're going to go for three first. Actually, I don't need that screwdriver. I need um, a hex because these have been converted over with a kit. An Allen, I should say. These these require an Allen, rather, um, not a corral driver. Although, if you're going to do it, make sure you use a JIS screwdriver for it. Um, need, I do need to take off that for the idle control though to get that out of the way if I ever if I need to go to number one Ugh. and that's why I use a JIS because it will strip out somebody has done that in the past uh, let me show you the fuel I drained each of the carburetors in you know one at a time into the fuel here and uh, you know it's not terrible yeah let me go ahead and test it it's good but it's got some dirt in it and surprisingly the majority of that came out of one and four actually i drained it four three two one so number four and then just dumped a bunch of that crud so you know this is my fuel can has got an inline filter i know that's good it's clean i keep it clean and the only thing i could think of is there may be some internal parts on the carburetor here because he's running you know ethanol fuel once in a while or pretty much all the time and sometimes it'll get at the rubber and start to actually deteriorating the uh, the innards the rubber innards Again, one, two, three, four, so let's take off number three. Well, it's not too all terribly bad if you really think about it. There is some crud at the bottom, but not really that much. Oh, actually, I'm wrong. There is a bunch of crud there. Look at this. I thought that was stains. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dirty carbs. Yeah, there is some crud in here. I'm not really sure what it, what it's from, but you know what? These gaskets don't look too all that bad. If we mind our P's and Q's, I think uh, we can reuse these. All right, let's talk a little bit about these carbs while well, I got it apart, um, and I'm getting it apart. And these inline four carbs, there's essentially two things that are really critical, uh, is the float height and the synchronization. They gotta be balanced. The float height is probably more critical because if each carburetor has a different float height and one is out of spec, that one carburetor could easily be running either rich or lean just because of the float height. There is a finite amount of play you have in there, and it's very narrow. And so you really got to make sure the floats are good. Now I'm going to take the floats out. Of, I'm, I'm going to pull them all, of course, now that I saw that. But I'm going to take the floats out of each one, one at a time, because these float valves are um, held in with a screw. I'll show you that in a minute, and just a little, little tang, really. 
and then it holds the valve down so you can remove those so we'll have to we'll have to do that we have no choice to look in there and see what the hell's going on with dirt I'm just going to take the float bowls off and then we'll just do an overall evaluation but that gives me an idea what's going on you don't really have to worry about keeping these organized the only thing you have to worry about is which way the drain screw is pointing when you put them back on so for example if I was to take this one and put it on number four's position which it would fit uh, the drain screw would be facing inside not outside like this one so you know you got to keep that in mind otherwise the uh, float bowls are identical at least in this model and pretty much every other Makini or Cahin that I've taken apart is exactly the same Four is not bad. It's got a little bit of crud in there, but it's not too terrible either. But we know we got junk in them, so we got to clean it. Uh, I'm not going to show you the entire disassembly here because I've already taken up too much of your valuable time on that. Uh, but I'm going to take number four out here, and we'll take that float out, and I'll show you what I mean. Essentially, nice clean end of the screwdriver. This is a JIS screw. It holds the actual float pin in place. Let me get some gloves on. I don't want to recontaminate all this. That's better. Be very careful taking this out. Easy to lose shit. Pin. Float valve, which is still hanging there. Put this float down for a minute. We'll take a look at the float valve. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Not really too mashed or anything. There is a little line there, but they weren't overflowing, so I'm not going to worry about that. Or they didn't, it didn't seem to be a rich condition because of a float problem, but we do need to check these. So I'm going to do this last and then I'll turn the camera off for now and then we'll come back when I get some more stuff apart. This is the little screw. It's like a uh, flange head screw, tiny one, don't lose it, that gets this out. Now most guys will grab these with a uh, pair of pliers. Actual float valve here, let me show you that. There's, there's the float valve, well actually it's the float valve seat, but you know, same difference. And you can, there's an O-ring in there. I'm, I'm hoping the O-ring's still good because a lot of times that thing needs to be replaced. Otherwise, it'll bypass the float valve and come around the float seat. And then you flood your carburetor out. And it don't work that way. This is actually a special tool, an 8 millimeter. It's actually for uh, knock pins or alignment pins. Uh, but these happen to be 8 millimeters on the OD. So this works really perfect for getting those out without marring them up just takes a five millimeter hex. Sometimes you cannot use them. You just can't get them into the carb because of the standoffs, but on this one you can. And out she comes. And that's what she looks like. We'll have to, I think the O-ring's okay. I rebuilt these carbs a while back, you know, before I sold it. I mean, when I first got the bike, I went through everything. I did a valve clearance check on it. It has the, um, those uh, stem and nut uh, adjusters. It's not a shim motor. So it's pretty easy to adjust. Um, it may be time for that again based on mileage, but I'm not going to worry about that this time. i got to turn this around and get it back to him. But um, yeah, so that's that. And I guess, let's see, there is now, I guess not. I thought, you know, it's got the little, got the little ridge on there for those little snap-on filters. I don't know, maybe it doesn't use it. I'll look at the parts fish and see what's going on with that. Um, I certainly wouldn't have left those off, but. All right, as promised, I'll shut up for a bit. Uh, it'll only be a second or two, and we'll come back, for you it is, and we'll come back and uh, see what we got overall. Okay, all disassembled as far as that goes, except for the jets. And uh, not surprisingly, all but number three are fairly clean. And you can see in number three there is some dirt and stuff sitting there. I don't know where it came from, but I got a suspicion that... The because the fuel cock is bypassing, uh, I would think that maybe there's a problem in those filter socks because I did look at the parts fish. There is no snap-on filters uh, rated for these carburetors. And I probably have some, but if they're not called for in a parts list, I'm not going to put them in because it may impede some flow. It's probably why they decided to do it. I don't know. You got me. I don't know. As far as the float seats go with, this, with those O-rings, and I'm going to take a look and see if I have some O-rings. I very well may have O-rings for these. I got a big lot of Suzuki parts from a customer and um, I, I may have O-rings for those. There was some carburetor parts in there. I suspect there may be some O-ring because there was a crap load of them. I mean, it was a lot of O-rings. I'll look up the part number and see if I have any that match because they all are in their original packaging. So the next step, which I'm not going to show as well, is uh, pulling out the jets. I will just explain what jet is what though on this particular carburetor. This one, this is your main jet. 
This is your pilot or slow jet, and this is your enricher jet. So that when you open that quote unquote choke, it's pulling fuel up this circuit. So basically, um, that is it. Uh, and again, so this is main, pilot or slow, which is probably blocked in number three here, and it may be partially blocked in the other ones, and then your enricher jet. There are some Makini carbs out there, and this one looks pretty similar, that use the same exact size jet. They're a little different. This one's got a little line in it, and this one doesn't. But they'll screw into their each other's place. So you got to make sure you put the right jet in. I've had customers that have had people rebuild their carbs, and then it won't run. It'll start great, but it just won't run. And that's because they, they switched the jets. So the enricher jet was in the main, which is a pretty big jet, uh, depending on the carburetor. Of course, these are pretty big jets, too, because it's a stage three hole shot kit. But uh, you definitely got to make sure you get them in the right place, put them back together. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take a, take a break, uh, probably get some water and cool down a little bit. And then I'll come back out and I'll strip this down off camera as far as the jets go. That's, and I'll pull the pilot screws out after I screw them in and determine what number of turns each one was. So I will write that down and then you know, just repeat that or duplicate it when I put it back together. Because we gotta definitely clean out this entire slow circuit, including the air jet for the slow side on the back of the carburetor here. There's an air and a main jet. I'm not really sure which one's which, but they're right here. One is big, one is small. It doesn't really matter. Just clean them out both out. Those are really critical too. And last but not least, before we come back, um, I'm going to tell you that you do not want to unrack these carburetors ever unless you have a problem in the fuel delivery T's or connectors. In this case it has one T. Some carburetors have two because it has two fuel inlets. You have one T inlet right here. It's right in that passageway for the float valves and seats. And then you have a connector here and a connector there. The only time you want to split this carb is if these are leaking. You do not want to do that because it is a major job and it's super easy to screw up and forget the little springs and stuff. Unless you're very experienced at it, don't do it. Just give it to somebody who can do it because that is a, a real, real tough thing to do for, for a lot of people that haven't done it before. So where are we at now? Uh, we got everything back together as far as, you know, to the point where I can put the float bowls on. I haven't cleaned them yet, but I just wanted to go over a couple really quick things because I know this video is getting long. When you're putting these jets in, uh, do not over tighten them. You'll snap them off, especially the uh, pilot jets. Speaking of the slower pilot jets, um, this bike, these carbs had 17 and a half Makini jets. Uh, those particular 17.5s I had in stock. So instead of just cleaning the jets that were in there, it saves a lot of time and it's cost effective just put new ones in. So that's what we have here. We got four new slow jets. Everything else has been cleaned. The emulsion tubes I wanted to mention that are that are part of this stack right here, this um, particular one, it's an eight millimeter, and then the main jet goes on top of it. You gotta make sure all those holes are clean uh, and do not over tighten this. Uh, what I generally do when I do a um, carburetor like this, using a wrench for it, obviously, uh, what I end up doing is I choke up or to, on the wrench to throttle the amount of torque that actually goes on there. So you can't really over torque it. If you go out here, I mean, you can snap these off too. So that's what I do. They don't have to be super tight. They just have to be a little bit better than snug. All the jets, same thing. Uh, everything else is done. Now I need to do the float level, which I will do off camera, and then I'm gonna do a pressure test. And that's something I can't get into on this video either. It's just too long. But um, what I end up doing is just making sure I check the patency of all the, everything up to um, the floats. So the float valves. When I clean the float seats out, I generally use a Q-tip with some Brasso, very mild abrasive. Stick it in there with a Q-tip. I sometimes do it under power, sometimes by hand. And uh, what that does is it gets rid of any scale or anything. And it may sound anal, but it also polishes the inside of this bore of these float seats. And it, it, in my opinion, it just makes the float valve operate without any restrictions, any dragging or anything. We want these things to react properly. So it, it does those two purposes. It cleans it and polishes it. And then I just clean everything up. And I did have O-rings in stock for the float seats. So I replaced the O-rings, clean them up really, you know, I took the O-rings, old O-rings off, 
little trick I use for that is with a uh, with a straw from a spray can and cut a little point on it and then you can work it in underneath the o-ring you don't want to use metal tools on that because if you scratch the surface underneath the o-ring it's a potential leak point so that's how I do that so yeah luckily I had the o-rings for that I also had o-rings for the slow screws so those are replaced as well so the next thing you're going to see I'm going to have them all back together we'll put them I'll have them on the bike and we'll try to start it up and see how it runs Okay, so I have everything hooked back up. The fuel is attached to it. I got fuel turned on. I'm watching for any overflow of the carbs, which I don't see. Um, everything's tight. Um, I did a pressure test on it and a float level adjustment, um, and that's going to be in a separate video, so I can't explain it in here. This one's already too long. So basically, uh, when you see that one, you'll understand. So I know the patency of the fuel delivery system as far as the the fuel line going into the carbs, the fuel T and the fuel connectors and also the float valves are good and the float levels are good too. Number three, which was our cylinder was giving us trouble, was the dirtiest as you saw, but in the other video where I do the float levels, the um, float in number three was uh, showing low. In other words, the float was too low, the float bowl, therefore it, when it goes up and it hits the float valve, it's doing that prematurely and the float bowl's not filling up enough. So I don't know why that happened because I was in these carbs last like three, three and a half years ago when I still owned it and it ran fine for him the last few years. So I honestly don't know, but it's all corrected now. Um, we got no fuel overflow. Everything's good. So we're going to go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to go ahead and take this mic and put it over a little further away though, uh, because I think it's going to overdrive the hell out of this. So there you have it. Pretty good, huh? Have let it warm up a little bit. The, you know, this thing's uh, jetted to a stage three, so you got to have the pods on because it's all tied together. And that runs pretty much exactly as it did when it was, you know, mine and when I sold it to him and he's been enjoying it ever since until this happened. So anyway, um, this is what we're going to do. I don't know if you noticed that in the video. I don't know if it caught it or not, but the exhaust pipe is doing this when I rev it up because it's loose. I guess the connectors loose down there are the, um, uh, what do you, like a hose clamp type thing. So I guess I'll take care of that too. There's a lot of things I, I probably need to do on this thing, but you know, I can't spend two weeks on it. So yeah, I like it. Runs good. Um, we'll shut the fuel off over here and then we'll shut off the video too, because I've already made it way too long. Anyway, really quick summary. Carbs all had a little dirt in them, as you saw. Number three was particularly dirty. In another video, you'll see me adjust the float levels and do a pressure test on the fuel delivery side of these carbs up to the float. So it incorporates the fuel line, the fuel tees and the fuel connectors all the way up to the float valves. That's again, in another video, everything's good to go. So speaking of go, I'm going to go now because it's already too long. I just wanted to close out by saying, as always, thank you for watching and I'll catch you on the next video.